The Angular team have been dropping new features and improvements for months. Now they've dropped a new site, new docs, new guides, and a new logo. To be clear, this is not another AngularJS to it's just Angular now style transition where basically it's an entirely new framework. Just about all of these features are additive. Migration tools are being made available and you can generally continue using the older style if you want. But if we take all of the new features that have been landing over the past year or so, and the additional features that will be landing soon, like signal-based components, we're looking at a pretty significant glow up for Angular. Angular will provide significantly better performance, a significantly better user experience, and a significantly better developer experience. So what will applications look like with this new style of Angular? We spent a lot of time on this channel looking at more advanced and sometimes esoteric concepts, but I thought it would be fun to strip everything back to the most basic bare bones Angular to-do app. Just the sort of application you might end up creating when first going through a quick start guide. This will be what the new first experience with the framework will be like for new Angular devs, and in my opinion, it is remarkably more intuitive than the old way. Now just quickly before we get into it, I want to let you know that my Angular course is now available. I'll tell you more about that later in the video, but you can find a link in the description if you want to check it out. Perhaps the most notable difference is ng modules no longer being necessary. ng modules are not easy to understand, but now you can basically just forget they exist. Instead of bootstrapping an application using an ng module, we can now just use standalone components. Mark the root component as being standalone and supply it to the bootstrap function in the main.ts file. Want to use some functionality in a component? Well, again, no need to worry about ng modules. Just import the thing you want to use in the component you want to use it in. This idea of an imports array for components is probably one of the final remaining obviously annoying things about Angular. You can't just import it into the file, you specifically need to add it to the components imports array as well. This is a minor annoyance really, but it is also something the Angular team is looking at, so hopefully we see this gone soon too. You can see I've got a few different components in the application. Uh, it's worth noting that the folder structure I'm using here is just how I like to structure my applications. I break things up into features that each have data access, UI and utils folders, and I have a shared folder for things that are shared between multiple features. I find this is an architecture that works and scales well with modern Angular applications, but I want to point out that it is not required to make an Angular app work. You could have all of your files inside of a single directory if you really wanted to. So as you can see in the root component, we have this router outlet, which is responsible for displaying the component we are currently routing to. The component to be displayed by the router outlet is configured in the app.routes file. All we need to do is specify a path and the standalone component we want to load when we visit that route. These routes are added to the app config, which is supplied during the application bootstrap step. If we take a look at the component for our home feature, the default feature we are routing to, we can see a few more modern Angular concepts. We are utilizing the inject function to make our to-do service, which manages the state for the to-dos in our application, available to this component. We are importing the standalone components we are using and adding them to the template. And let's not miss the revolutionary and memeable fact that Angular now does indeed have self-closing tags. If we take a look at the implementation of the list component, you can see we are also using the new control flow syntax in the template to loop over the to-dos and display a list item for each one, or a message if there aren't currently any to-dos. Also coming soon when signal-based components land will be the simplified approach to inputs and outputs. You'll be able to create inputs like this, and if I switch to the form component, you can see that we would create an output like this. The way we supply these inputs and bind to the output events remains unchanged. From a syntax perspective, this is a bit easier than the previous method, but more importantly, the new inputs will allow our components to receive inputs as signals. This means that we will be able to easily react to inputs changing and derive reactive values from inputs. I'm trying to keep things pretty high level here, but there are other exciting aspects of signal-based components, including dramatic improvements to how change detection works in Angular. If we take a look at the detail feature, we can see a bit more control flow syntax usage here, but more interestingly, we are also making proper use of signals. Many of Angular's APIs still return RxJS observable streams, like this param map that is an observable stream of whatever the current route parameters are. These will likely be available as signal APIs at some point, 
but for now we can easily use the toSignal function to convert the observable stream into a signal. We are then using that signal to compute a new signal. We filter the to-dos from our to-do state signal to find the one matching the ID from the param map signal. Now we have a signal containing the to-do that matches whatever ID was supplied in the route. The cool thing about signals is that anytime any signal that the computed signal depends on updates, it will also update the value of the computed signal. We can now use our to-do signal in the template to display the specific to-do for the current page. Now before I annoy too many people, I am extremely pro RxJS in Angular. My general position is that RxJS is great for managing data sources and events, and signals are great for state. Using these concepts together in Angular is extremely powerful. But I think not making RxJS part of the initial Angular experience, or at least not forcing people to interact with RxJS, is a good idea. There is no getting around the fact that RxJS requires an investment of time to learn, and being forced to use it without the time and motivation to do it properly is probably going to lead to issues and a misplaced hatred of RxJS. I think this is clear in how polarizing the topic is within the Angular community, and I suspect it's responsible for a good chunk of people who have stopped using Angular and also took a hatred of RxJS with them. Now before we continue, I want to quickly mention that I have just, as in at the very moment of publishing this video, launched my Angular course. It is a massive text-based course that aims to thoroughly teach Angular with the goal of building professional grade applications using concepts and techniques that are used by some of the best Angular developers and companies. It starts at the beginner level, covering the fundamentals of building modern Angular applications with all these new features, but it quickly builds up to more advanced concepts which underlie the general philosophy of the course, to learn things the harder but ultimately better way. This course is suitable for people at the beginner level, all the way through to people who are already at quite advanced levels in Angular. And when I say massive, I mean specifically that this course has approximately 12 modules with a total of 104 lessons. This is something I've put an unhealthy amount of effort into, and it contains every important thing that I would want to teach to other Angular developers. If you're interested in checking it out, you'll find a link in the description. The launch sale will be active for 48 hours from the time this video was published. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is the to-do service we are managing our to-do state in. There aren't really any significant changes here, we can still just create injectable singleton services that are available to any component in our application. The big difference really is again the signals, as we can use these to help manage state now. This is what a basic state management setup might look like using signals. We have a private signal that holds our to-dos, we can update that in this add to-do method, and we also expose the signal publicly, but as a read-only signal so that it cannot be modified from outside of this service. I suspect something like this will largely replace the ever popular service with a subject pattern. Personally, the basic state management approach I am taking in Angular looks a bit different to this. I don't want to derail this video into preaching about declarative code and using RxJS with signals though, so I'll link to a video in the description if that topic interests you. So does this mean that Angular is back? Well, it never really went anywhere. Angular has remained a widely used framework since it has existed, becoming second only to React and effectively equal with Vue. But it did gain a reputation, whether the memes are fair or not, as being the framework for enterprise nerds, tortured legacy code maintainers, and Java lovers. I never thought I'd see the day again where Angular would be a contender among the hot modern frameworks as in the kind of framework someone who is just getting into web development might pick on their own because it looks cool and seems popular, rather than learning it because the job you want or have needs you to. But I think the Angular team is making all the right moves, and I mean, just look at how pretty the logo is now. If you like this video, I'd greatly appreciate a like or subscribe before you go, uh, you can check out my course using the link below if you want, and I hope to see you back here again for the next video.